All right, let's go on the record with 23 SC 188947. Who do we have as lead counsel for the state today? Good afternoon, Judge Nathan Wade, Special Prosecutor for the state. Um, here present at the council table with me, I have Executive District Attorney Daisha Young, um, Deputy District Attorney Will Wooten, and Special Prosecutor John Floyd. All right, thank you, Mr. Wade. And for Mr. Chesbro, who's lead counsel today? Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Scott Grubman. I'm representing Mr. Chesbro, and with me, I have co-counsel Manuel. All right, and Mr. Grubman, have you received uh, express authority to waive your client's presence today? All right. And who do we have for Ms. Powell? Uh, Brian Rafferty on behalf of Ms. Powell, Your Honor, and I have received express permission to waive her appearance. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, so just a few preliminary thoughts before we kick things off. Uh, to be clear, the scheduling order we entered uh, for Mr. Chesbro um, earlier last week didn't contain any kind of a ruling on severance. So the plan would be to try to resolve as many of these issues as we can this week and to begin entering scheduling orders for the remaining defendants by either the end of this week or the early next week. So with that, uh, is there anything else we should take up before diving into argument, Mr. Wade? The, the court had asked uh, the state to be prepared to respond in, in its uh, notice of the hearing, asked the state to be prepared to respond to a certain uh, uh, questions, a good faith estimate in terms of time, how many witnesses, um, and so forth. We're prepared to do that if the court would like. Okay. Well, let's do that during your argument uh, okay. in response after we hear from uh, defense on their motions. Okay. Okay, so I think just taking it alphabetically, there were two motions we've scheduled to be heard uh, today from Mr. Uh, Chesbro. So, Mr. Grubman, uh, floor is yours. And I think the idea would be to try to limit this to 20 to 30 minutes. We'll see where the discussion takes us and go from there. Would your honor, would it be acceptable for your honor if me and my co-counsel, Mr. Aurora, there's kind of a natural split. I'd like to talk about the um, kind of groups of facts that will go to both of our motions, both the motion to sever counts and the motion to sever from Ms. Powell. I believe the court indicated you would want to hear arguments on both. And then Mr. Aurora will talk more specifically about the statutory factors, if that's okay with your honor. And it won't take more, to, we won't take up more time than any one of us would have. Okay, how about it? Thank you, your honor. Your honor, I want to start off by saying we recognize this as a RICO prosecution. We recognize that, and we do recognize that part of RICO is, you know, providing prosecutors, at least the state would argue this, and there is some case law to suggest this, providing prosecutors with a little more um, ability to bring in conduct um, that's maybe broader than had they charged a direct crime, for example, in this case. There are, I would argue, three, four, or five separate conspir alleged conspiracies really contained in one alleged conspiracy in this indictment. Um, Mr. Chesborough is only concerned in terms of the evidence or allegations with what I'm going to call the alternate elector alleged conspiracy. The allegations contained in, the, contained in the indictment, and of course I'm not saying that I believe they are true, but accepting them as true 
shows that Mr. Chesborough, at most, was only involved in that aspect of the conspiracy. Specifically, the allegations show that Mr. Chesborough sent approximately eight, sent slash received approximately 18 emails, all in his role as an attorney for the Trump campaign, asked to opine on the application of the 12th Amendment to the United States Constitution and the Electoral Contact, and then several other emails. Most of those additional emails were simply transmitting the memos that Mr. Chesborough wrote that are alleged in the indictment. And one or two other emails to certain state officials discussing the logistics of how to go through the electoral contact. So that's what I'll call the alternate elector alleged conspiracy. Mr. Chesborough has been indicted as part of that conspiracy. He's alleged to be part of that conspiracy. Obviously, we will defend those charges, but that's conspiracy A, if you will. Then there are two or three other conspiracies. With all due respect to Ms. Powell, and nothing I say, of course, in this should um, indicate whatsoever that I'm commenting on the evidence against Ms. Powell. And I apologize, I know that's not Ms. Powell, but her representative, <laughs> Mr. Rafferty. Ms. Powell is alleged to have engaged in a conspiracy, again, just accepting the allegations and the indictment is true, dealing with the computer systems down in Coffee County, Georgia. Um, and those computer systems, as we allege in our indictment, Mr. Chesborough, or I'm sorry, in our motions, Mr. Chesborough is not even, even alleged to have undertaken anything even remotely related to the Coffee County conspiracy, which I'll call it. Then there's a third alleged conspiracy. And that third alleged conspiracy, I'll call, uh, um, I, I don't necessarily want to use her name because um, of the circumstances, but the poll worker conspiracy, where there are allegations that certain individuals named in the indictment went and tried to apply some pressure tactics to a certain poll worker that I believe works here, uh, lives here in Fulton County. That is also a conspiracy that in no way, shape, or form involves Mr. Chesbro. And again, that's not my defense take on it. That's according to the allegations in the indictment. Now, again, as I started off, Your Honor, I understand that RICO does provide flexibility. What I would argue to the court, however, is that, of course, RICO does not overrule all of the rules and statutes and constitutional provisions that ensure that Mr. Chesbro not only has a speedy trial, which of course he's already demanded, but a fair trial. And Mr. Aurora will talk more about the detailed case law, but it's pretty clear here, Your Honor, that if this case were allowed to go to trial with either all 19 defendants, which obviously it seems like that's probably not going to happen, but even with just Mr. Chesbro and Ms. Powell, you, you're gonna have two cases in one. You're going to have, and I'll be very interested to hear the government's good faith estimate of evidence and witnesses, but you are going to have days, if not weeks, God forbid, maybe even say months, given some experience in some other high profile cases that are happening in this building under the RICO statute. You're gonna have weeks, if not months, of testimony just related to the Coffee County allegations. And because, I mean, if you've, just reviewing the publicly available information, related to the Coffee County allegation shows that at least the, how the state pro, um, indicted it, it's a alleged wide ranging conspiracy um, involving various people, involving very specific allegations of, about computer trespass and the like. And then you're gonna have a full trial, same trial, but somehow you're gonna have to have another full trial within that same trial about the alternate electors. Now, I suspect that the government is going to, or the state, I'm sorry, is going to say, well, it's all connected with the same purpose. And therefore, it makes sense to keep all these charges together and keep all these defendants together. But, Your Honor, I would ask you to please keep in mind that the purpose that we're talking about here, I mean, I guess you can say the purpose is to elect Donald Trump president. But if that were the purpose, <laughs> and a prosecutor could, lead, could use a purpose of that magnitude to try to tie together charges and defendants that otherwise have nothing to do with each other, then, you know, before we know it, we're, I mean, millions of people, literally millions of people could have been charged in this conspiracy. These are totally separate cases, Your Honor, and I believe, as you'll see from my colleague, Mr. Aurora, who will get 
up and talk about the case law. Thank you for allowing us to do that because he's um, a lot more on top of that than me. And as you'll hear from Mr. Rafferty, I suspect on behalf of Ms. Powell, it is going to significantly um, affect these defendants' rights to a fair and impartial trial. Why should Mr. Chesborough have to deal with a jury who's going to sit there for weeks, if not months, and listen to all of this evidence related to Coffee County and Ms. Powell? He's never been there. He's never met Ms. Powell. He's never emailed, texted, or called her. He's never spoken with her directly or indirectly. And although I'm not trying to steal the thunder from my colleague, Mr. Rafferty, on behalf of Ms. Powell, same is to be said for Ms. Powell. Why should Ms. Powell have to sit there for weeks and months hearing evidence and testimony about the alternate slate of elector alleged scheme when she's not even alleged to have any involvement in that? And again, for the third and last time I'll go back to, I do understand that RICO exists, whether we like it or not. The prosecution chose to bring this case under RICO, although they could have very well brought this case specifically against individuals who are charged with individual crimes, but they chose not to, and that's their discretion. But, Your Honor, that should not override Mr. Chesborough's right to a fundamentally fair trial. It's in the state constitution, it's in the federal constitution, it's in the Georgia Code. And I'm, I'm really worried that allowing evidence related to all of these other counts and all of these other defendants, in, in particular, in this case, Ms. Powell, will, will very seriously jeopardize this. I think, as Mr. Aurora will, will make clear, it is clearly well within the discretion of the court if not, as we argue, mandatory to grant some uh, to grant this um, severance from Ms. Powell and also to grant the severance we asked for related to the counts that don't affect Mr. Chesborough. So with that, Your Honor, I'm sure you'd like to hear some case law or supporting authority. So I will let my smarter co-counsel, Mr. Aurora, get up and deal with that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Which uh, motion do you want me to address first, the severance of the counts or the parties? Uh, yeah, why don't we dive into the severance of defendants? I think that's the one that we might have more to talk about. All right. Well, I think, Your Honor, I, when you were DA, probably battled against each other on some of these types of issues, trying to get severances together, but that was in another lifetime, I guess. Um, I've tried to put most of the case law that we've got that's in the briefs, because in the end, I'll give you some more 2023 cases that just came down a couple weeks ago, both federally and in the state system. Um, but in the end, I think a fair assessment is it's your decision. I mean, there's nothing that says if X, then Y, or if Y, then Z. It's just basically you're going to have to weigh the options. Is it my voice, or is it ringing? There might be a little bit of a feedback. Okay. Um, so with regards to the severance, with regards to Ms. Uh, Powell, I'll go ahead and start the court off with Henderson versus State, and I've highlighted it for the State, and may I approach your honor? Sure. Uh, I came down about two and a half to the and if you go towards the second to last page on the back, uh, I've highlighted that for the court and for opposing counsel. <clears throat> so as you'll see at um, head notes 40, 41, and 42, like it says, everything's basically in your discretion. But in this case that just came down a couple of weeks ago, um, what we were talking about is sort of highlighted in regards to sort of similarly the facts in our case, right? The first issue is going to be, is there going to be any confusion about the evidence? Are there conflicting defenses, antagonistic defenses? And in the end, um, is there going to be confusion as far as that goes? Um, there will not be any antagonistic defenses because the two people don't overlap at all in the indictment or any evidence that I've seen. Um, the issue is going to be what's the confusion, and one of the remedies is obviously um, jury charges. And in your case, the question becomes how many jury charges can you bring, uh, can you provide to the government, uh, government, the jury, as far as trying to understand all these types of things. So this case that I gave you is a RICO case involving gang-related type charges. And what it basically says is those two people were charged with the same crimes, and in the end, the court didn't sever those matters. We don't have that here, right out, out of the gate. There's no antagonistic defenses. I'm not going to get into factor three. There's really just overflow and spillover as far as that goes. And so the question is, 
is the evidence against Ms. Powell going to impact her? And the reason I say that is we're charged in the RICO and then six predicate acts. The predicate acts only deal with the elector slate as far as who filled out the electors, was that fraudulent or not. With regards to what happened in Coffee County, you're going to have a ton of other charges from witness intimidation, computer hacking, fraud. That has nothing to do with Mr. Chesborough. The other thing you look at is, are these other pieces of evidence going to be similar transactions potentially, which wouldn't be in this case because they have nothing to do with one another. There's nothing similar about it. So when the government <coughs> argues that it's RICO and we get to bring in anything in the kitchen sink, I think the cases that I'm going to cite you, there's a couple more also from 2023 that talked about, yeah, you can bring in everything, and it's mostly been like gang RICO type cases or some type of violence that's out there. It still gives you an out based on what you think. And the reason I bring these up is in all those cases, everybody's charged with the same things. Here, they can argue that it's a similar activity, but not to speak for Ms. Powell, but essentially from what I understand from the public record is she was fired before this conspiracy actually even started up because she said something that was supposedly crazy and the Trump people got rid of her and whatever she did was sort of on a lark on her own as far as Coffee County goes. That's just my understanding from the public. Again, I just want the court to focus in on what type of evidence would come in against Ms. Powell versus what we're charged with, which is solely paperwork and legal opinion on three different memos and some emails. So with that, I'll approach the court on a RICO case that dealt with drug dealing that just came down in the federal courts in March of this year, not a light circuit there. Again, I've highlighted everything that's that I believe to be relevant with regards to this case. Uh, Mr. Rowe, what's the site on that? Um, the site will be uh, two, 2023 Westlaw 2620418. Um, and if your honor would look at um, just above head note seven, it's gonna be about three or four pages in, I realize the bottom of my pages have sort of been cut off, but it would be if you just fold over three pages and I've highlighted it. And so again, there they talk about co-defendants being charged in conspiracies and you know why there's a joinder in these matters. But again, the factually speaking, if you look at it, the charges are the same against each person and then the severance isn't necessarily gonna change anything as far as that goes. And again, I know I'm repeating myself, but we don't have similar charges. It's completely different if you look at the uh, indictment as far as that goes. Again, I'll emphasize, we are charged solely with the elector portion and the ballots that they filled out that were sent up to Washington, D.C. <coughs> versus Ms. Powell isn't charged with any of that. She's charged with, I guess, computer fraud and some other things as it goes to Coffee County. Um, and lastly, before I rest on this part of this argument, um, the seminal case that came down dealing with suppression would have been Zafiro versus United States from back in 1993. This also is a drug conspiracy because almost all the RICOs and the conspiracies, unfortunately, dealt with drugs and violence, and it's just sort of an outlier or a case of first impression for all of us here. And if your honor goes to the um, head notes that are labeled 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 on the third page over, um, they talk about the risk of a fair trial in this situation. Again, in Zafiro, they didn't grant the continuance, I'm sorry, the severance because the parties were interacted and they just mostly talked about antagonistic defenses because one co-defendant would say the other guy did it, I didn't know anything about anything. But they also talk about what evidence could have been admitted that wouldn't be considered against someone else. And so in our position is, if you look at Georgia case law, it talks about would they be similar transactions so they could come in or some other vehicle. None of that exists here in this case. And like Mr. Grubman said, they're essentially different mini conspiracies within this entire RICO Act. And so what evidence are you pointing to that's inadmissible in your trial than would be in another? With regards to Ms. Powell, we would object to a lot of that stuff because it would impugn our character as far as being associated with somebody which they'd have to prove. Now granted it's admissible if we're going to trial together, but you would have to give limiting instruction after limiting instruction after limiting instruction as far as that goes. And at some point if we're going for a week or a month or however long the trial is, I don't want the baby to get thrown out with the bathwater. That's why I'm emphasizing. We are charged with sort of the intellectual part of this case, right? We wrote some memos talking about how the ECA and the 12th Amendment works, and that's a separate motion we filed uh, that we'll need to take up in the future about those issues. And then 
specifically in Georgia, we sent two emails to the head of the Republican Party as alleged. That's it. In the RICO count, <clears throat> in the RICO count, there's 160 some odd overt acts. As the court knows, there's an overt act which doesn't have to be a crime, and there's predicate acts. We are not labeled as having committed any predicate act in the RICO conspiracy in this case. We then have six substantive counts, all that deal with whether the electors are fraudulent or not and whether they filled out the paperwork was forgery or not. That's essentially all of it. With her, you don't have that. You've got what happened in Coffee County as far as did we have computer fraud, computer trespass, did we intimidate people, were we suppressing the vote, things like that, that you know I've read about and I've seen the public atmosphere which is going to come up. That has nothing to do with us. Our whole point is we were a thousand miles away from here. We wrote intelligent memos based on our experience in the Gore versus Bush campaign, which we also worked on. And we basically said, if there is a valid underlying offense, then the ECA and those arguments that I'm making could be valid. We had nothing to do with the actual shenanigans, allegations, whatever, in the state of Georgia necessarily themselves. And that's where I'm trying to distinguish it. Because you could very easily say it's just two defendants, so there may not be a confusion of who's what. But you're essentially running two trials simultaneously in here. And so I don't think giving limiting instructions of me objecting to all of it it is fair. And I think that's what Zafiro and some of the other cases talk about. And I brought those up because even though they ruled against us and everything, the analysis was relatively sound. And in the end, it says you can do what you wish because there is no specific X than Y situation. So that would be my argument with regards to Ms. Powell. So uh, let me unpack a few of those because uh, so under the kind of traditional three prong metric we're looking at, uh, one of the recurring themes is, is spillover evidence. And if you're saying that essentially what we've got are, are two different trials or two different uh, conspiracies that have been joined into this umbrella, uh, and and you said that um, Mr. Cheesebro never even inter interacted or knew Ms. Powell in any way, uh, where's the where's the spillover there? If there's if they've actually never interacted, and these counts are entirely separate, as you keep kind of pointing out. Well, the spillover is essentially, I mean, we can't hide sort of the elephant in the room that sort of overglosses all this stuff. I don't know what evidence the government's going to try to present with regards to how they prove the RICO conspiracy or the knowledge or those types of things. What I'm saying is, yes, there's going to be separate evidence going up against Ms. Powell, but at some point, the sheer volume of it all, there's going to be sort of a connection. We're sitting at the table together, and that carries a lot of weight. Your Honor's one of the very few judges that's done a ton of trials as far as that goes, and you know the impact that's going to have um, as far as that goes. There's just a reality. I don't know if there's a legal theory that says it out there, but you and I both know that's going to happen. And I'm not discounting that, that it, it might be, you know, obviously inconvenient and, and burdensome, and it might take a lot of time. But do we have any case? Uh, you, you cited to the to the Price case, uh, yes, I think, as, as a reversal of a denial of severance. Yes, sir. Have there been any other cases in the 43 years since then where a, a denial of severance was reversed? It's incredibly rare. I haven't found it. I'm sure somewhere in this country that's <laughs> happened as far as that goes. But what I was trying to say is severance traditionally, even like when you and I interacted, is in a group of three or four people accused of committing a crime together, specifically you murdered this guy or you sold these drugs, you did this. It's not you sold drugs, you murdered on a separate day, a month apart, whatever it might be. There's a time lag here. There's a completely different set of facts that go with it. There's no interaction or knowledge as far as the parties go. So there's no way for us to presume how much damage that the evidence against one person might eventually spill over uh, regardless of the instructions. And that's what I cited to you in the Griffin case, you know, out of Georgia from 2000 by the Supreme Court. It's a decision you have to make. I can't presume any of that, but having a ton of experience, you having a ton of experience in trials, you know that that is a substantial risk um, as far as impacting a, a fair trial because her charges are way more pro provocative versus the boring old charges that we have as far as just sort of the paperwork type situation. And that's what I worry about because it tinges on racial issues, voter suppression, all those kinds of things are going to come up, you know, based on what's happened in Coffee County. And that scares the heck out of me. So are, are you saying that in line with Price, I think the way Price has been distinguished over the years is one defendant had overwhelming evidence and the other defendant didn't really have much. Are, are you saying there's a defendant here who has overwhelming evidence as compared to your situation? Well, I don't have a discovery yet, so I can't necessarily say. I can just base it on what I think the evidence is going to be. Um, I don't know if I'd call it overwhelming. It's completely different, and I'm sure there's going to be a ton of it from what I've seen.